Hi guys, so I suggest we briefly run through the previous episode and refresh our memory. As you remember, we firmly decided that the van from the future should be an electric car. In fact, that's why Nick welded this subframe. It will house an electric motor, which we paired with an automatic transmission and installed as follows. Then we connected the whole thing to the axle with a custom drive shaft. That's it. And the goal for this episode is to run the whole circuit and get the wheels turning. Looking ahead, the mission was accomplished. Here's what we've got. A battery and an inverter, I guess. We need to try it all on the van now. To do this, we'll unpack our new assistant. Yes, it's clear that the factory layout from the Nissan Leaf doesn't fit in the body of the futuristic van. Looking ahead, the layout had to be conceptually redesigned. But Nick doesn't know it yet playing his Tetris. With a whole block like this, the battery doesn't really fit anywhere. You know, to make it all pretty. So now I'm going to try to disassemble it. Overall, it took us almost a whole day to come up with a look for a proper arrangement of all the elements. At first, we decided to try breaking the blocks into smaller units and spacing them evenly around the perimeter. Disassembled, separated and tried on. They stand on the racks here for now. I probably add three more here and three more here. And then we'll make some kind of mount underneath that goes around the universal joint. The universal joint has a small range of motion, so I don't think it'll interfere with that. We'll leave a margin. Some of the batteries will fit in here, so the guys sent the batteries to us in the near factory layout. But to implement them into our van, we're reconfiguring them. We'll weld separate power housings for them, which will be sealed in the future. After a bit of brainstorming, we did decide to abandon the idea of placing the batteries evenly across the frame, as this arrangement would have forced us to make a lot of connections, which is long, expensive and not very easy. Eventually, it became clear that we needed to do two large separate units. In fact, that's what Nick is doing. We decided to put all the batteries in two blocks. One will stand on the left and the other on the right. We gave up the layout where we spread all the batteries all over the bottom. We decided on this one, as it is easier to commutate less wires. Well, in theory, it will help us in the future. The boxes themselves are made so that it's convenient to remove both the whole battery box from the car down, to lower it and simply disconnect, let's say, the bottom frame, and just get it out from under the car with the batteries. It's all rolling in, it's all convenient enough, and it's turned out pretty well. To avoid jumper cables here, because the native wiring harness is going to go here, I used the native jumper cables that go inside the battery, and connect inside with through hole studs, and connect to the two frame with these bolts here. It all worked out concise and fairly simple. Everything is connected, all the frames, all the bolts, everything. That's what it looks like. Now we're positioning the unit in the body so that nothing gets in the way of anything anywhere. There is clearance for switching, for wires, for everything. I have prepared these sets of plates with cage nuts, they will be located here. There will be reinforcement braces. Bounding within the sparse of the load is evenly disturbed. And in the front, we'll have the brackets here and here. We'll have the strut here. Ok, now we're gonna weld. And finally, the first fitting. While Nick is installing the batteries, I'll tell you a little about the project. At the base, we have all the components from the Nissan Leaf. Frankly, we don't know much about electric cars. The DP Labs team, on the other hand, does. And this project can be safely called a call-up, as all parts and technical support fell on their shoulders, for which many thanks to them. This is the structure we got. I suspended the box, on top of which I hung these plates. There are mating plates underneath. The cage nuts are welded here. To screw everything in and assemble everything from the bottom. Jumper in the spar, in the frame, so that the weight is disturbed evenly. It's not very pretty yet, it'll get better. After a long break, back to work on the van again. We've laid out all the components the guys sent us. We're figuring out the layout, where, what, how. I'll be removing all the extra stuff from the inverter now, because our space is severely limited, and I'll fit it somehow, put it up. Trying to put it in place, looking for a place for it closer to the motor. Here's the picture that emerges. Trying to find a position so I don't have to redo this huge connector that has to come in here. But there was no way to find such a position in our layout. Either the batteries are in the way, or the legs, pipes are in the way. It doesn't fit very well because of the huge power connector. And the fact of the matter is we're still going to have to remodel it. We'll probably take it apart. It's detachable. Let's lengthen the wires and assemble everything on the same connector but with the length of wires we need. And it actually stands like this. 
Well, they're in racks for now, suspended temporarily on jacks. It's got all the clearances, all the wire connectors are clear. It's all gonna be hooked up from the bottom, like always. It's the water system, so the water is drained out. The problem is that it all sticks out in different directions everywhere. If you choose one position, something else gets in the way. So I spent the whole day trying to decide which was the lesser of the evils. Now we'll probably have to redo this one fitting here, because it's looking straight down, and we'll probably put it out either here or there. Then we'll look at the schematic to see what it is and where it's powered from, and what it's feeding. Now we'll have to come up with a mount for it all, but it's kind of matter of technique. There's clearances everywhere, everything's there, everything's standing, everything's at floor level. We wanted to put it all in the back, but it also kind of interfering with the U-joint and slope. So most likely it's all going to stand like this. It's gonna be hooked up, the cooling system's gonna be plumbed in, and everything will be hooked up. And then it's a matter of technique. It only took two nick days to invent, fabricate and install all the mounts. I've already hung up all these boxes. I can get a good shot of it. There is very little room. I'll show you. This is the top mount here. This is the bottom mount here. That's it. It's all assembled on the dots. And there is this attachment here. Here are the threaded bushings. The attachment itself is here. Two points. And one point here. The challenge was to keep access to these connectors, so that the layout would fit all the connectors right here. There is another connector here. There's connectors and a water line here. So everything is cramped, tight, but there are some gaps. There is a threaded rivet here too. All right, we did the minimal wiring with the wires we received. We realized what we needed to expand, what we needed to buy. And while there's time, we should remove the battery pack and swap the batteries, because I assembled them for the native connection cassette where they are connected in the staggered order, and we need to put it together so that we can just use one rail to line it all up. Yes, by these points we have decided to use a different way of commutation. In our opinion it's much simpler and more reliable, of course based on our layout. That's how they were put together before. Red, 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 in a triangle, red. And now they should be assembled like this, even in strips. So we could just make a rail, copper, not copper, with holes in it and connect it all together. It's like it's going to be even a little bit easier. So from this block and that block, we'll be able to put together two of these packs. The missing batteries that we ordered have arrived. Now the task is to pull out of this pack the ones that Alexei marked with crosses. There is a lot of them. And packing again, I'll take out the marked ones. Instead of the marked ones, we'll put the ones that came in. Put it all back together again in one of this, to balance it. And then reassemble back into those batteries as we had them assembled. In staggered order to get them wired up and put them on the car. We have some staggered patterns going on, but that's the way it has to be done. Let me explain a little bit. Initially we knew that some cells were dead, and they will have to be replaced. We propped all the batteries, figured out the traitors, and ordered similar replacement cells. In fact, we are replacing and reassemble it now. I reassembled them once again. That's it. I dumped all the ones that were defective, tired. It's a whole box. I don't know what's gonna happen to them. I don't know how we're gonna dispose of them yet. So I put this together. I had to turn one over because it turns out there are left and right batteries. I put it in first to balance it out temporarily for now. Then we'll decide where to put it, what's the right thing to do with it. These two towers, and they weigh like a ton, holy moly. The next step is to put it all together. To do this, we disassemble the factory wiring and proceed with the custom rewiring. We received the wires, terminals and a special thing to crimp the terminals. To make things neat and tidy, corrugation, special metalized which we will use the metal in it as a screen. The corrugation is thicker, the wire is thick, it's KG25, that's KG50, that's KG25. Now we're going to cut it all up, measure it, 
look at it. Crimp it, slice it and put it in the van. Then there will be long, long hours of slicing, switching, crimping and other wiring work. We check and test it all once again, because the voltage here is quite serious and reaches up to 400 volts. We connected the wires with the Alexei, coiled them up. Here, here, all the wires. Here too, the connector is almost ready. There's still some finishing to do at the end. We're putting everything back in place now. Yes, it looks like simple and quick in the fray, but it really isn't, as this is the first experience for us. We often got bogged down with details, questions, etc., stopping work for discussions. After that, we called DP Labs tech support, solved the problem and moved on. This is our past steering, as it was decided to abandon it due to its complexity of organization with CNC stepper matter. Separate controls for it, all sorts of things, adapters. Well, it was clear from the beginning that the system was a bit complicated, but we couldn't beat it ourselves. That was the only way we ended up with a simpler system, with the help of the guys. We now have the steering system. It's an EPS from a Nissan Leaf, the same place we got the engine from. And now the EPS itself will turn there. Not the CNC engine as we had before, but the EPS itself. So all we need for steering is this thing and a gamepad. My job now is to wire up to tech. I'll probably have to take out all this extra stuff and replace the mounts from the EPS with the mount of this EPS. It works a lot better than our past version. So we decided to scrap it all again and put this in. Let me get this straight. In one of the previous episodes we have already implemented the gamepad control ourselves. The layout turned out to be a little tricky. After that, Peter from the DP Labs team said he had a ready-made Nissan Leaf component system that was much simpler and more reliable. Of course, we couldn't refuse such a gift of fate. As we change the EPS, this stepper motor pad, the EPS pad that's a little bit in the back. This mount here, we'll have to cut it all off, cut it off here, so that'll be removed. And well, it all over again. The power steering is from the lift. We've got a lift piece of the U-joint. There's a whole one, we're using a piece of it. And we have the back end of that. Now I'll see how to connect it all optimally. So that it all looks nice and works perfectly. But having to cut it all off is certainly a shame, I've been trying so hard to weld it. As you can see, the mount that took half of the last episode to make, we're removing and throwing away in this one. What can you do? That's our job. Like I said, we're not filming our workshop, we're filming our story. We make mistakes, we redo it, and we honestly tell you about it. During the construction process, we often cook food outdoors. I know that a lot of people enjoy watching this format, so we decided to do the other channel on which we will post videos with cooking food in the forest. Anyone who is interested in this format, be sure to subscribe to our new channel, the link will be in the description. I disassembled the EPS, removed this thing from it, the casing on the steering column, on the steering wheel. We have the shaft, there's the safety thing, well, the splines that move the steering wheel during a crash. And I don't think we're gonna use it for anything. We're gonna cut it off right here, right here. Here I will plug the hole, and it'll be just a dust cover, just to keep the dirt out. And we will have a rotating pot only on one side, and from here it goes out to the rail. We have absolutely no need for that pot. We won't have a physical steering wheel in the car. So now I'm going to carefully cut it right here, slowly, a little at a time, so it doesn't get hot. I'm going to tape up the whole thing now. There's kind of an oil seal in there, but I'll probably still tape it up just in case. As you can see, we've finally given up on the physical steering wheel. The end result will be some sort of a controller in the van. We'll also be able to control the vehicle remotely via Bluetooth using the PlayStation controller. I've installed the EPS beforehand, we're waiting. I wrote to the turner to make us an insert here. Here we're gonna keep the original splines. And here we'll reduce the diameter there'll be a connection to it. It goes about like this. The universal joints are not bent. The angles are critical at all. I just need to figure out how to mount it here. I finished the lid. As you can see, we removed the old stepper motor mount, as well as the stepper motor itself. Now we need to come up with a secure mount for the Nissan Leaf EPS. Just 1.5 hours of work and we have this result. This is how the mount turned out. Here I used pieces of the original fasteners. It fits perfectly here. Here's the reinforcement, here's the main fastener. Here's the rear support belt. This is the main axle. That's it. That's how it's mounted. 
The turners are gonna bring the universal joint back to us now and we'll put it together here. That's it, plug it in and go. Now I'll tell you how our advanced turn works out. We have a PS4 controller. It connects to the ESP32 board via Bluetooth. It received analog values from the controller and transmits them to the electric power steering. Now our wheels turn accordingly. But in order for them to turn with a certain amount of force, it depends on the speed, since we don't have a speed sensor yet. We send a pack from the Arduino through the MCP2515 module via CIN line that we have zero speed and the wheels turn very easily. We're about to have our first rough start. Alexei didn't even unwind anything. The universal joint was manufactured, lengthened. That's it. Just the first lunch. Not even cleaned up at all. Curiosity prevails. Alright, let's go, huh? Let's go. We're authorizing the EPS. Click. Something's clicking. And go. Whoa! Okay, take that off. Something's in the way, I think. Well, there is movement. Come on! Oh, okay, it's inverted now. Very quickly. But it's possible to do slower. Yes? Well, that's cool, but the sensitivity, yeah? But it's regulated, as I understand it. It is. I mean, here we go. The system is as efficient as possible, from the remote. Here is the controller. I'll film the controller and the wheel. Ah, oh, you've got an inversion, like left and right mixed up. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not a problem at all. It's not a big deal. This is what it all looks like in the finished state. This is where I left the factory splines. I got this one ground down. It's fixed. Here it might just be a cutter pin afterwards. Here's the original universal joint. The engine itself. The engine mount. It's all pretty good. While I have time, I'll be doing research on what it actually is. How it will even work. The master brake cylinder from the lift, which we also have should be controller operated brake. Figuring out the wiring. Figuring out how to look it all up. Now I'd probably take this thing off so it would be room here. I'll see if it's even possible to do that. Figuring out where the front and back lines are. We'll shut down the back line, we'll have one left. Because we don't even have drums in the back, and the front will have brake calipers. Here we decided to take the past of least resistance and use brakes from the same Nissan Leaf. Because all these units were originally in one chain, and it's much easier to connect them to each other. In addition, this is a component from an electric car and the principle of operation is different from that of a car with an internal combustion engine, and consequently it'll be much easier to implement the brake and throttle via the controller, but more on that later. This is how the brake master will be installed initially. Here is the place for the output of the chip, and there will be probably be room for a removable tank. This will probably be cut off in the future, that's where we'll be mounted it from up here. Now it's just one more thing. We need to come up with another mount. Thankfully by this point Nick had got a lot of practice and it took less than half of a Nick day. And by late afternoon we had this thing. This is the finished look of the mount. Everything screws in, everything's mount. This is where we're gonna have a ribbon wire coming out. This is where the tubes will go forward, backward. This will likely be removed in the future. That's it. It's all about the tubes, the houses, quarter tubes, ordered caliper repair kits. We have these calipers from MIDI. Of course, they are in the most deplorable condition. It's all corroded. It's really bad. The guides are bad. The pots are gone. Cylinder appears to be wedged in. The tubes are dead. Full restoration. Complete restoration. Because it's just really, really bad. This is where a lot of people will probably have a question. Why are we using calipers from the Suzu MIDI and not the Leaf? We originally bought a MIDI as a donor. There is not much left of it, but the front beam is still from it. Which means the calipers will become bolt on. Now all that's left is to make nice new calipers out of this old junk. I'm working in my garage today. I've got this little amateurs in blasting chamber, and we're getting the calipers ready. The first thing we should do is mask everything. All the holes where the threads are. Now they are in this condition. Rust is extremely crumbly, so we decided to not clean them. No, just take them to the garage and sand and paint them. This is what the mask part looks like. It's to prevent Sam from damaging the threads inside. The cylinders themselves are covered by the old cylinders. We have a new repair kit. It's scraps of tubing and pumping.
This is what they look like after sanding. All clean. The cavities are certainly deep on them, but it won't affect anything, I guess. That's it, now we have to blow them right off, degrid them again and paint them. Okay, our painted caliber. Repair kit and rubbers. Repair kit new piston. And we'll assemble it with special grease just for assembling braking systems. We put everything in, rubber, duster, cylinder. We reassemble, run the threads. If something is left under the rubber bands that might be dirty, that's it. This is the finished look of the calipers after we built. I painted them, I ran all the threads. That's grease for the guide rails. There is grease for assembling the calipers. All that's left is to buy new pumpers, because there were no pumpers in the repair kit. And that's it. It's all painted. It moves, it runs, it works. It's all nice and smooth. While Alexei is busy starting the engine, I'm working on the braking system. I installed the master brake, hung a separate reservoir for brake fluid. Now I'm engaged in lining of tubes. To run them, the teeth, all branches, I had to cut out these tube holders and weld them directly in place. We should make sure that nothing gets coughed during the steering, as the steering travel was increased. And this is what the finished system looks like. Here's the caliper, the tube attached here and here. Next up is the copper tubing. When the steering wheel is working, there is nothing sticking or pawing, everything's safe. No rubbing, no pressing, everything's great. Now to do the same thing on the other side and run all the main tubes. But brakes. Nissan Leaf brake cylinder again. It works like a vacuum booster, but not really. It has engines inside instead of vacuum, and he's gonna help us brake our van. Alexei will explain principle of its operation and how it will connect to the gamepad. I installed it, installed the reservoir for it, connected them, and routed the brake pipes. Brake tubes, welded up all the fasteners. Haven't filled it up yet. Haven't refueled it because Alexei will be taking it off to hook it up. We have a situation today, no electricity. There was some kind of accident at the substation, so we are working in a daylight. I will probably continue to build batteries. By this point we had finalized the method of battery commutation. What does it look like? This is the look of our rare assembled batteries. I am now once again hooking it up and rolling into the car. This battery is installed. These ones too. Everything is connected. The engine is connected to the inverter. The inverter is connected to the PDM. We still need to connect the power lines, one here, one on the other side. And deal with those noodles and maybe try cranking the engine. Hopefully a little. Hopefully we won't burn out. We'll raise the rear axle just in case it's planning to go somewhere. Because none of us really understand how the automatic gear will behave here. We're gonna try something now. Yes, a lot of people had a question in the comment under the previous episode. Why do we use an automatic transmission and why do we need a gearbox in this chain at all? We'll talk about this in detail in the next episode. When we'll actually fully test the car on the move. And now we have the task of spinning the wheels. Thus checking all connections. We suspended the rear axle in the air checked everything that could be checked once again and got ready for the first launch. We will also have gas brake implemented as well, but this board is already too small. Additionally, DAC modules, digital to analog converters will be installed, and the system will be the same. The analog triggers send a signal to the ESP32. They send to the DAC, the DAC to the PDM, let's say gas, and that's how the gas brake will be implemented. We have connected all the electronic units. They are connected to the PDM unit via contactors. The plus one is shunted with the resistor. The minus one is direct. So, when switching on, the minus contactor closes immediately. The plus contactor no at once. The capacitors in the PDM are smoothly charged through the resistor. And once the nominal voltage is reached, the PDM monitors this and starts the second contactor. So now we have all the control on simple switches. This is just for testing purposes. Next, we said we are gonna have game pad control. This will be the gas paddle. So far, the battery charging has been implemented in the simple way. Just to the 220 power line, it turns out that we have battery packs with no board and no BMS system. Charging is controlled by the PDM. We will have an actuator on the automatic transmission that will have switch between parking, drive, neutral and reverse. 
the controls will be done with the gamepad too. While Alexei plays with the controller, Nick checks all the components. And finally the first push. Is it going? Hey, don't spin it so fast, Alexei. Don't be too hard on it right away. Is there a wire rubbing against anything? It's rubbing somewhere. Regarding the latest work in the van, the steering has been changed. We dumped our old electronic power steering from the Renault Clio and the CNC stepper motor. Because it was too complicated, we installed a single electronic booster from a Nissan Leaf. And Alexei taught it how to operate our steering wheel with the help of the guys. It turned out neatly, concisely, reliably, without unnecessary notes, without unnecessary connections. The next shipment of parts arrived. I want to pick them up. The radiator on the automatic, oil radiator, main radiator, and pipes, houses for connection, clamps, booster pump. Now I'm going to clean it all up, fit it to the car, and install it. The radiator is from a Nissan Leaf. The oil cooler is from a Defender, I think. I don't even remember. I just chose the one that had connectors on both sides in a narrow shape. This is a special oil and gasoline resistant hose of a diameter we need. The pump? I wanted to get one from Nissan Leaf, but it costs much more, so I got one from Nissan X-Trail. Clamps? And there is also stuff like this to connect the oil radiator. I started to feed the radiator with a hand. There was no better place for it than over there. We changed the angle in a little bit, it'll be higher, it'll be at an angle. I've already started here, I've made a little mountain bear for it. Now I'm thinking about how to tie it up properly all over the place. You also have to think ahead to leave room for hoses to avoid creases. We won't have a fan yet. I don't think we'll ever get the engine hot enough to require a fan. And then it's just a matter of time. We just need to install, connect and test it all. That's basically what Nick did. Right there, right there, no Chris. It goes right here. This is where we're gonna secure it. It should come here. Here, so we cut it like this, with a margin. To cool the automatic transmission, we decided to temporarily install this radiator. We knew that in all likelihood we would still replace the transmission with a similar but mechanical one, which doesn't require cooling, so we attach the radiator nominally. Let's recap on the cooling system. Go through the elements, what goes where, what it fits into. We didn't stray far from the factory layout. We made minor adjustments based on our layout. It seems that the pipe goes from the engine straight to the radiator. It comes out of the radiator into the expansion tank. From the expansion tank it goes to the PDM. After passing through the PDM, it goes to the inverter. After passing through the inverter, it goes through the electric pump, back to the engine. We got this closed system, which basically should work. It's not gonna get too hot in here. It'll be fine. That's for sure. Our goal now is to test the van overall, how it runs, where it goes, what's wrong with it. Again, we have some issues with the automatic. It's still unclear whether it will run or not. It spins the wheels in the air, but again, we don't know how it behaves on the move. Even within the team, we are already disagreeing with each other on whether or not it will run. Theoretically, it will go somewhere in first gear, but will it shift? Will it run fine under throttle reset? How will the electric engine behave with an automatic? We still have no idea how to control it all, especially with a gamepad. The brakes are connected, fully extended to the front axle. We're not touching the rear axle yet. Even if we drive it, the front brakes are more than enough. All that's left is to pump them up. And the steering. We're all set on the steering. Now our goal is to pour brake fluid, pump the front brakes. That's what we have this metal rod for. Let me show you how it works. We'll fill it up with the water. For now, probably distilled water. We'll pour it into the cooling system, because there is no point in antifreeze yet. It's unclear how airtight it is, how it's all. We're going to check it all over and put oil in the automatic to pump up the system while Alexei adjusts the unit's communication with... Oops, it's leaking, leaking, leaking. Stop, 
So the brake fluid's already reached here. Now it's gonna reach there. It got there. Stop, don't drip, please. Okay, we're almost done pumping the brakes. Look how it works. Back to our lever. We used the lever to pump the brakes while Alexei adjusts the brake master cylinder control unit. It works. It's a sample from improvised material. It works as a very simple lever. Just... That's how we're gonna pump the brakes. There is air coming out everywhere. Let's get Alexander to help. In the end, after 15 minutes of these simple movements, the brakes are pumped and we can move on. The next stage is the cooling system. We pour in plain distilled water for now to test it all out. Naturally, we won't be driving the van in the winter either. On the street, I hope so. Now all that's left is to put oil in the transmission and in theory we can drive it. Since we didn't have a dipstick, we couldn't really check the oil level. So we put in another jug just in case. Then we put in the battery to start the electronics and finally it's time for the first real run. That's it, we're good to go. Is the bagel spinning? It's spinning, but it's not pumping oil, I guess. I'm still rooting for the fact that there is not enough oil in the gearbox. All right, I need someone to hold the brake there. There might be a problem. Just to clarify a little bit, at this point that big lever is acting as a brake pedal. That's why we keep close to it. There, as you can see, there's a little smoke coming out of the dipstick. Well, it's the friction plates burning. We should probably refill the oil again, more. So the engine is spinning, but nothing is happening. We gave the engine a good spin. A little smoke came out of the dipstick. So we decided we needed to add more oil, plus an extra jug. I love the way it turns on. I need a huge switch like that, and to make it sparkle like in the movies. After that, we rev the engine again, and again nothing happens. Well, almost nothing. Oh, you! Alex! I was like, that's it, the van's running! They said it could use a nudge, are you keeping away? No, I'm not touching it! After which the following occurred. Either we have, like that guy, the client told me. He says it's the valves. Well, no, the guy was saying that if you just spin it, it's dead center, first a third gear in the crash mode, it's still driving somewhere. Who? No one pushed it? No, it works! So in the end, the issue was low oil. Maybe it needs to be pumped on each mode? Anyway, Alex, go get some more oil. We'll feed her until she starts working. Maybe I should go to the gas station. We'll put in a jug of oil again and proceed with the test. No, stop! moving after all. That's where we decided that it was a matter of not enough oil and we put in another jug to be sure. Alright, it's running. Oh wait, we still don't have a reverse. So the first one we got was drive. So did we check? It's reverse in the gearbox. The gearbox is in reverse. Try it backwards now. That's what I want. There is a radiator. Maybe it didn't want to go into the radiator. It's not a big deal. Where is reverse? Drive, parking, reverse, right? No? How? Who drives automatic? Well, look at it. The next one after the drive, which is towards yourself. Well, it's second to last. We suspend the rear axle in the air and run the transmission in all gears. Thus trying to pump the entire system. Then satisfied, we put the car on the ground with a firm intention to drive. But there was another setback. That's it, I'm definitely going forward now, to success. If success is there, I'm going there. Then another 20 minutes of testing and discussion, and again the car randomly starts completely smoothly and drives perfectly. Then it stops and again doesn't respond in any way to the throttle button. That's when we came to the conclusion that it would have been better if it hadn't started at all, and would quietly bury the idea and proceed to install a manual transmission. The radiator is warm, like the gearbox is warming up, which means that there is oil in the radiator. 
We ended up checking the oil radiator, there was oil in it and it was warm, which means the system is working and the oil is circulating. For extra security, we put in the last jug of oil and then another last jug and another try. Well, either the gearbox is dead or there, it's pumped, it's got plenty of oil. And as you can see, it's a flop again. And then together we notice a pattern. If you put it in gear, that is drive, while the engine is at least minimally revving, it works perfectly. We tested the theory right away. That's what it turned out to be. Here it is, it's running, and then when we stop it's not driving. Yeah, it's working somehow. I hold the throttle a little bit and it goes a little bit. It's not gonna go now, is it? It's not gonna drive a second time now. That's it, it's not driving a second time. Well, what do you think if we push it out and just drive around while the guys are here? Well, because it's not a big deal if we go easy, smooth, slow. We don't have to accelerate. Just drive around slowly, turn back and come back since we are ready and it's not dark yet. And contrary to hundreds of comments that the automatic transmission won't work in this circuit, we've proved the opposite. Now we just need to work out some of the issues. For a full-fledged test drive, we roll the car out to a special closed testing ground. And as you can see, it steers, handles and drives perfectly. The only issue is fail brakes. One of the connections turned out to be defective and we were traveling at minimum speed, but the power reserve was huge. In fact, we were only pushing the button by 2-3%. Let's summarize. We originally put in an automatic transmission, and yes, it was a questionable decision. We did this just because we had this gearbox and decided that the circuit should work. We were interested in testing this particular combination, keeping in mind that we might replace the gearbox with a manual one if necessary, making sure in advance, of course, that there is an interchangeable mechanical counterpart. That's why we made a good mount and all the adapters right away. In addition to the hundreds of comments that an automatic box would never work, there were several hundred more comments that we didn't need a gearbox at all in this layout. That's particularly true, the car will really run without the gearbox. But not for long, more on that later. So we roll the van back into the box and move on. We had tests, everyone has seen it. And yet we've decided to try and put a manual gearbox in here. It runs, with some flaws, not without nuance, but it runs. The nuance is that it only runs after, if we put it in parking, crank up the engine, and while it's still there, switch it into drive and then it runs. It responds to the throttle, accelerates, you can let off the throttle, hit the throttle again. It's great, we're fine with it. But there are these little nuances, plus it's leaking like crazy all over the place, here from the gear oil seal, down there in the bottom of the pan. There is no point in repairing it, so we'll try to put a manual gearbox in here. Now we'll find a manual gearbox that will fit on our flange that will require minimal rework. Before installing the new gearbox, we first remove the old one and we can move on. We borrowed a gearbox from the guys at the wrecking yard with the stipulation that I'll bring it back. Well, everything seems to be similar, but we have to measure. That gearbox I brought last time didn't fit at all. It didn't fit the bell or the length at all. It didn't fit in any way. Thankfully, we were advised by a man that any box you buy, it will fit. They are visually all very similar, but still have all their differences. This time, I got a different box. It doesn't seem to fit as much anymore either, but at least we have a chance to put it in the car, because some of the holes will match, and we'll just drill the rest. All we care about is getting it to fit through some holes so the alignment stays. We also need to buy a clutch plate for it to take the spline from. I'm gonna try to install it on the car now. This is what it looks like with the manual. I figure it out. Only the top two bolts match. Visually, the primary and engine are also perfectly aligned. Other things we're gonna have to redo. We're gonna have to change that rear cross member, the coupling on it to fit our flange, and modify the support saddle mount. Move it a little to the left. And so, in all likelihood, we may not even have to extend the universal joint. Because it moves here on the splines. Maybe this distance will be enough for us. Well, it's not that bad. What is also important, I also paid attention to it when choosing, that the mechanism of gear engagement should be preferably linear. So here we have gear shifting only linearly, in two directions. This is the row selection, and this is the gear engagement. That's two functions, pull and push. There are no ends, no nothing. That is, we'll be able to make the gear engagement control remote if we need it, if only forward-backward. 
Ok, well, now that we've decided that we're settling on this gearbox, the first thing we do is wash it. That's the most important thing, because well, it looks disgusting right now. We change the rear end and take out all these extra things. We restore it to a state that we could work with, and we start working. We're waiting for the clutch disc, from which we'll take the center spline. This is what the washed gearbox looks like. It's already neater, it's already safe to touch it. And now we're down to the small stuff. We just need to come up with a couple of adapters, spacers and put the gearbox in its rightful place. But beforehand, we remove everything we need from the old gearbox. The most urgent, most long-awaited parcel arrived, travel for three days. We waited mega long for this. We've got a used clutch basket and disc coming in to put on the manual. It's all going in the trash. I had to overpay, of course. But all we need is this spline. Our goal from here is to get this spline to match the one we have on the gearbox. We're going to do it now. The last cutters have arrived as well. So maybe the first shavings will be made today. I just unpacked it. The goal is to measure to see if it even fits our gearbox. It's perfect. Just right. We waited three days for it for a reason, so we're taking it apart. I need to disassemble it now, most likely to drill out all these rivets to carefully get the center, and to connect the center with our old adapter, where we have splines from Nissan Leaf. Now we need to do a little more. We had to drill out all the fixing points, free the part and master it to left. That's what Nick did. Getting ahead of myself, I will say that it took just under one Nick day to do it all. I took the clutch plate apart. Here is what we needed, just the spline part. I tried it on the manual, and it turns out that we need a distance of 1 inch here. Now we're going to cut off this axis so it doesn't get in the way. Here we have it cut on the left, centered. When this spacer was left, I asked the guys to have all the splines in one pass. So I used this tube with a thick wall. I think it's 1 inch, I can't remember, it's actually seamless. I milled the adapter from here to here. All pressed and welded. Well, that's the plan for now. I'm gonna try to make it happen. None of us has worked much at the left, so we'll be learning training. Yes, indeed. No one on our team has any experience with the left. That's why we picked up a small benchtop machine, which we ended up being very happy with. Hopefully, we will eventually progress to a large professional machine. In the meantime, we will perform some complex tasks externally, and the simple ones will be made by our own efforts, thereby gaining in hand and evolving. The first piece I've done. I've made it. I've chiseled it. This is what we're going to put in here. It fits tightly. It doesn't come loose. Now the idea is to prepare this part. Cut the axis around. Then weld this to this flange. And then clamp the whole part and make the required diameter here. Under that, to keep everything integral as much as possible. I haven't decided how I'm gonna do this one yet. I'll probably cut off the axis with an angle grinder, and then I'll just machine it. That's probably how it's gonna be. Here's the first shavings, guys. Lovely. After that, a few more passes and the design as a whole is ready. All that's left is to put it all together. Here it is prepared, taped up. The part we'll later use as a base. Once again, I can stop marveling at this table. Well, we use it everywhere. I even put my GoPro on it, on all those mounts. And I put it in such a way that there were no sticking points at the bottom. Nothing. So that the bottom would not stick when there would be a mess from welding. That's it. I'll rotate it and weld it here. Maybe even in one go. It's ugly, but it's secure, and that's what counts. Okay, so in a rush of excitement at what I'm doing, I've even put this detail in here already. It went with a light tap with a hammer, just a little bit actually. There's chamfer out here, there's a little gap here, specifically for me to weld it all up now. It's all spinning. The flange has run out here, but we don't have the flange involved this time. I can even cut it off. I didn't cut it off because it doesn't matter. That's it. Splines on this side, splines on that side. Our finished adapter. Set it up like this. Now I'm gonna try to put the gearbox in.
Finally, we go to the fun part. Building a LEGO set for adults. I think it's clear by now that electric cars are the future, whether we want them to be or not. Analysis shows that by 2030, one in three cars sold will be electric. The gearbox is installed, it's got two bolts on the top, and that's a good thing. And it's centered, all the shafts are connected, everything spins. You can hear the electric engine spinning as I shifted gears. And nothing is, it's like everything's fine. Now the task is to add mounting holes. There are two here and I'll probably add two more at the bottom to check how this whole structure behaves and works for the first test. On the universal joint, I changed the rear flange, put it in a clutch. I took the duster off from here to see how many splines we have, the length of the splines. Here, if you put just like that, first of all, the bolts won't screw in here, and second of all, the splines are not big enough. So right now the spacers from the mountain here are temporary. I'll probably make spacers out of this flange. I'll just cut it off like this. Here's flat, here's the fit. So everything should be precise. We will not accelerate to some cosmic speeds on the first test and in the future to avoid rebuilding the universal joint, because it's expensive. We will make a spacer here, and we will add a spacer on this shank too, and thus pushing the splines inward. I'll put the duster back on, it'll all come together. There is a still an open question on the rear transmission support. It doesn't fit, the box is shorter, the mount seems to fit to the box, and the support needs to be a little bit out there, so that's when I'm cutting off now and extending, welding a new console. As you figured out, Nick set all this task for himself, and immediately, not daring to disobey himself, he began to carry the mount. I ended up drilling the missing holes and threading them. Then we cut off the mounting and secured the gearbox firmly in place. I sewed off the old mount, separated the plate from it, so that I didn't have to make a new one, and the pipe, and cut it all up. And I think I'll even put this pipe back on this side, and I'll put a second one on the back side, supporting it, so that the mount doesn't fall forward. As you can see, Nick has put together a great team, and once he got a concrete plan of action, he immediately began to implement it, and by the end of Nick day, we have this beauty. On the technical side, we're all set, the manual. I connected the universal joint. There's a little spacers like this here, pieces from the previous flange. They go into the groove here, they have a flat here, so there shouldn't be a problem. Temporary, not temporary, I don't know how it'll play out. I welded one of these things, haven't even welded it all the way through yet, just welded this side. Then when we take it all off to paint it, I'll weld that side. The backside. We are in a rush to get out now, because the rains are coming soon. It's already raining, so it's very important that we get out. So we're plugging everything in. It's probably wet out there now. We'll cover this whole thing up with stretch wrap at least, protect it. And we'll try a test drive. Well, because winter is coming, and we're not going to have that opportunity until it's all done, and it's closed and sealed. We're getting madder and madder, so the world will see this creation. The passengers cease for driving this miracle. Since we still have work to do on controlling all of this via gamepad, there are issues there. So this is what the driver and passenger seat looks like, as it is. Sticks, planks, clamps. It's classic. In the end, we decided not to wait for good weather that might never come, but instead wrapped up the van and took it out for another test drive. I'm still really concerned about the brakes. They seem to be missing an electrical part, that's all. So let's try it out, shall we? Look, the brakes! As you can see, it works perfectly. We just need to figure out the brakes and connect it all to the gamepad. Manual transmission is definitely the right choice. 
and here's a word or two on what it's even for. Basically, we use the gearbox for its intended purpose, to change the gear ratio. And if we connect the electric engine directly to the rear axle, we get a big stress on the electric engine. Yes, there is no gearbox in electric cars, of course. But they work very differently. And in order to get our wheels spinning in a relatively proficient manner, it is still necessary. In the next episode, we'll do a simple calculation and show it clearly. Like, subscribe and write a comment. Thank you for watching and catch positive attacks from the X.